Uh, let's let's turn to the book of Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter four, and we'll pick up where we left off in verse seven. Then I returned, and I saw vanity under the sun. There is one alone without companion. He has neither son nor brother, yet there is no end to all his labors, nor is his eye satisfied with riches. But he never asks, for whom do I toil and deprive myself of good? This also is vanity and a grave misfortune. Ecclesiastes 4, starting in verse 7. And so there's two problems here, one of which is that this individual that Solomon is talking about has chosen solitude, has chosen to be alone, has chosen, has not, has not partnered up with somebody else. He is alone um, and presumably by choice. But the second problem is his eye is not satisfied with riches. So he keeps working, he keeps working, he keeps working, he keeps working. There's no end to all his labors. He gets up, has to do the, go through the same work day after day after day after day. And he's not satisfied with the riches. And so he's working towards a goal of being wealthier, being better off, that he's never going to attain. And he never even stops and says, why am I doing this? Why am I working so hard? Why am I doing the same thing day after day after day? Why have I deprived myself of good? Why can I not stop and smell the roses, as the world would say? Why don't I take some time and go fishing? Why don't I have a child or a grandchild? Why, don't, why, don't I, why is there not something more in my life than just working and toiling and depriving myself of good? This also is vanity and a grave misfortune. The, the takeaways here are we can't do it alone. Obviously, we can't do it without God. We can't do it without the Spirit of the Lord in us. But we also really can't do it by ourselves as, 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 as men, or I'm sure as women. What did, what did God say when he created Eve? He said, it is not good for a man to be alone. And when Jesus sent out his apostles, he did not send them out one by one. He sent them out two by two. Um, and so, and so, uh, trying to keep it all for yourself, trying to go, trying to go it alone, and then being hung up by this whole notion that the world would have us believe that more is better, and that, and and the harder I work, we have so many, so many men in jail that we see, and then we see them again six months or a year later. Or, 18 months later, and oftentimes what they say is, well, you know, I got out, I was doing good, I was in the Word, I got a job, but then I had an opportunity to work 60 hours a week, I had an opportunity to work 70 hours a week, I had an opportunity to work 80 hours a week, and I just knew that if I worked harder and bring, brought home more money, my wife would be happier and my kids would be happier and everything would be better, and I worked instead of figuring out what it was God wanted for me. I worked instead of spending time with my children and my wife and my family. I worked instead of because Satan, through the world, has convinced us that more is better. Bigger house is better. More money is better. Richer food is better. Faster car is better. Fill in the blanks. Same way in the church. Yes. Uh, and when were we getting the billboard? This also is vanity and a grave misfortune. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him is who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. Again, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. Or how can one be warm alone? Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Well, and I, and I think the whole point is that 
Um, and, you know, I remember, I don't remember if it was in church camp. I don't remember if it was vacation Bible school. I don't remember if it was physics class where you take one string and you can snap it pretty easily. And you take three and you twist them together and you try to break it and you can't break it. I think the whole point is that, that there's strength in, in more, more, more people together. That, well, and that, I think that's certainly a, leg a, legitimate, a legitimate understanding of that is that you've got two together and the third one is if you've got, if you've got the Lord on your side, you can't, cannot be broken. Yeah, it, mm -hmm. and you know, in the, in the two thousand years ago, well, at this in, the, in this case, three thousand years ago, when there's when there's when you live in a uh, a mud hut or an adobe hut or a little rock hut or a stick hut, there's no electricity, there's no electric blanket. Um, keeping a fire going all night long is difficult getting you know getting up against somebody else for heat makes a lot of sense and and there's absolutely no implication here that there's anything that there's anything um, impure or inappropriate about this it reminded for some reason whatever I re read this I rem I'm reminded of an article that was in the National Geographic magazine that may have been 50 years ago now and it was an article about training special forces and I don't know if they were Green Berets, I don't know if they're Marines, but they were special ops forces. And there's a picture of like five guys, and they're and, and they got nothing on but their briefs, but they're sitting in an ice cold stream. The water's about this deep, and you can see ice on the banks. I mean, the water is ice cold. But the five of them, the one in the back, there's one literally up against his chest, one up against that man's chest, one up against that man's chest, and they sit in that ice water for an hour. And they're being trained that there is no pride when it comes to survival. That guy in the middle that's got somebody up against his back and somebody up against his chest, he's, he's surviving. He's, he's getting by that cold. Um, you know, now we think of two men laying together and it's automatically our mind goes to something perverse. But in this case, and, it, and it's not necessarily two men. Two are better than one. I think of a marriage, a marriage relationship. I think of God. I think of God bringing Eve out and saying, "You know, let me present you with, with Eve. It is not fit that you be alone." Mm -hmm. Eskimos. Um, I, at one time, I went through a phase where I was fascinated by Arctic expl exploration, probably because I can't stand the cold. And uh, and uh, I read an account. I had a, I had a couple of books published in the mid 18 mid 1800s by guys that had tried to be the to go farther north than anybody had ever gone um, and one of them fell in with some Eskimos and and at night inside the Eskimo the whole extended family they take off all their clothes and they get in a big pile and they put blankets on top of themselves and, and that collective warmth that collective heat from their bodies keeps them warm Right, the ice, the ice itself provides insulation from the, from the temperature outside. And, and obviously, if one falls, one will lift up his companion. Um, th that really is kind of self-explanatory, but when you think about it, I know I have been out in the woods hunting or hiked a long ways off fishing. Um, even where I am now, if I'm if I'm, if I'm at the back at the creek, I realize that I can't scream loud enough for Ron to hear me. And it, and it occurs to me, you know, Ted, you, you need to be careful. If you get snake bitten down here, if you're, if, you're, if you're climbing a tree for some stupid reason and you fall out of it, you know, and now having a cell phone helps, but if you land on that cell phone, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and of course I did, you know, there were no cell phones when I was growing up, and there have been a number of times when it's occurred to me, you know, where I am, where I am physically right now, if I fall off of this rock and hit my head, if I get snake bit, whatever it is, I'm in trouble. I'm all by myself. So, and again, the point here is just well taken. It is God did not intend for us to be lone rangers, not spiritually, not emotionally, 
not physically. He created us as families. He created friends. He created, he created bodies. We're a body of Christ. He created bodies. He created the church, particularly upon the death of Jesus on the cross. He created the church. And, and my brother J.R. was talking about people calling him not, not always when he necessarily wants to be called at, you know, at the wee hours of the morning, but, um, but it, we can, God gives us, some of us, a calling to literally save lives by being available when somebody is at their wit's end, when somebody's about to jump off the cliff, when somebody's about to stick a, a gun in their mouth, when somebody is... Um, God gives us the authority to lift up and encourage and, and to be that and to be that friend and to be that partner for others. Verse 4, chapter 13. Better a poor and wise youth than an old and foolish king who will, not, who will be admonished no more. He's, 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 he's arrogant enough. He's stubborn enough that he just he's no longer teachable for he comes out of prison to be king although he was born poor in his kingdom talking about the poor wise youth if you're wise enough that your wisdom shows that people can see how wise you are um, you know that can carry you very 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 far uh, if you live wisely and you take advantage of the wisdom and live in the wisdom that God gives you. We could go read, you know, the what second, third, fourth chapters of fifth chapters of, of Proverbs and, and see the value of wisdom. Um, it's possible that Solomon has in mind Joseph here when he talks about coming out of pre prison to be king. Um, but but the fact is that that foolishness, hopefully, foolishness will not get you anywhere. But in a just society, at any rate, wisdom will carry you far. And, and, and those that God has given wisdom to, and those who have sought out wisdom and cherished and valued wisdom and lived in accordance with God's wisdom, should, should, and when I say prosper, I don't necessarily mean become rich, but should, um, should att attain to positions of authority and positions where that wisdom can be put to good use for the entire community, for the entire church, the for your entire home. I saw all the living who walk under the sun. They were with the second youth who stands in his place. There was an end of all the people. There was no end, I'm sorry, there was no end of all the people over whom he was made king. Yet those who come afterward will not rejoice in him. Surely this is vanity and grasping for the wind. I saw the living who walk under the sun. They were there with the second youth who stands in his place. So this is somebody who's, who's attained some level of, of authority, who lives long enough to see his son and his grandson, those who will succeed him. And yet, for all of that, once he's gone, nobody, those who come after him will not, will not rejoice in him. Um, a foolish king, uh, one who does not, does not leave a good legacy, people are not going to, uh, in fact, in fact, it talks in places about, about the nation being glad when he's gone. Um, we see, you know, all through First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, we see kings that just dragged the kingdom down. Um, in fact, in fact, you know, Israel ended up ended up in in exile and, and conquered and destroyed and in exile, and so did Judah as a result of their kings. Those those kings, nobody missed. And on the other hand, there were kings that that. David comes to mind immediately, but Hezekiah and Samuel and, 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 and others that, that were righteous kings and good kings and, and, their, and their nations prospered under them. 
because they were because they were good kings. Surely this also is vanity and grasping for the wind, the notion that just because I'm king, just because I have a lot of people under me, just because I'm in control of a lot of things, um, you know, that, that somehow makes me great. It's God who gives wisdom. We choose whether or not to seek Him and to seek that wisdom and to live by that wisdom. And when we do, our families prosper, the church prospers, the community prospers, um, and the kingdom of God prospers. Chapter 5. Walk prudently when you go into the house of God and draw near to hear rather than to give the sacrifice of fools for they do not know that they do evil. Wow. Um, this is a verse that, that probably has stuck with me as long as I've been a Christian. Walk prudently when you go into the house of God and draw near to hear rather than to give the sacrifice of fools. Now, clearly, God raises up people in the church whose job it is to speak, whose job it is to teach or to preach. And clearly, um, if we are filled with the Spirit and we have spiritual gifts, there are going to be times when, when we're to speak. But we don't go to church in order to be heard. Fools do that. Fools come to, and I want to be careful how I say this, but I think we all can think of people that we've known in churches over the years who just just liked like to be heard. Go go read the first let, Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, and you'll read about a church where everybody wanted to out gift and out talk and out sing and out prophesy and out you know out perform everybody else. Um, on the other hand, on the other hand, we should we should go to church expecting that we are going to leave the world behind, that we're going to have a time of reverence and a time of worship and a time of fellowship, and that we're going to hear God speak through people, and we're going to have an opportunity to hear God, to hear the Holy Spirit, and we should come to the house of God for what we can receive from God, what we can receive from the Holy Spirit, what we can do to encourage the flock. What does it say over in the 10th chapter of, of Hebrews? It says that one of the reasons we gather is to encourage one another to love and good works. Um, some of us have attended large churches, large, I'm going to just say it, middle class churches where, where people would get brand new cars and they would show up early so they could park that car right out front where everybody could see the new car uh, and they would wear the nicest clothes and sit in prominent places and and clearly clearly wanted to be seen we've known people who when they pray just can't pull enough you know 50 cent words out of the hat to string together to to uh to, to try and impress each other or try to impress others with how righteous they are and how knowledgeable they are. And, and Brother David has been saying this as long as I've known him, and he's right. We do not, we do not um, sweet talk people into the kingdom. We don't browbeat people into the kingdom. We don't eloquence people into the kingdom. We don't lead into the people into the kingdom with fancy, like Paul said, I did not come with eloquence of speech. Um, we, if we're doing our job, we, we share the gospel of Jesus Christ with people and then the Holy Spirit takes it from there and convicts them. I'll, I'll wrap up with this real quickly. I was, I've mentioned this before, but I was over in the Caldwell County Jail one evening and there was a, a young man like 20, a young man who had come to jail, an unbeliever. Um, and a lot of people will sign up to come to Bible study because it 
either they're curious or the spirit compels them to and they can't and they come and they say I don't know why I signed up for this but something just said I need to sign up or it just sounds like more fun than two more hours in the tank with these other bozos okay I mean that's just and, and they're but he st he came under the sound of the gospel and he made a profession of faith and he got very excited about his relationship with God and started bringing a Bible and sharing things and and uh, um, and I think he was really saved and and he said, well, he came in one, one, one Tuesday and he said, well, Brother Ted, I'm, I'm getting out next week. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to go home next week. And the first thing I'm going to do is go find a church where I'm comfortable. And I said, I said, with all due respect, with all due respect, go find the church where God wants you to be. Pray about it. Pray about it and go where God tells you. You may not be comfortable there. And he, and he thought about it for a moment. He said, you know, you're absolutely right. You are absolutely right. That's what I need. I need to be in the church where God wants me. I said, now you may be comfortable because you're so convicted by what the preacher said, but you may also be uncomfortable because God has sent you as a light into a place where there's some darkness. And you may have something that that body needs that, that God's going to send you there to share.